Praise God. This morning we're going to be reading a verse from the book of 1 Peter. So open your Bibles to 1 Peter 1.13. 1 Peter 1.13. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you your word is spirit. It is truth and it is life. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move on our lives today, that you would move in our lives We declare, Lord, that as we continue in your word, then we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. And Lord, we look for that freedom in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The word of God says in 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's quite a peculiar expression when you read a statement, the loins of your mind. You don't usually think of your mind and your loins in the same context, do you? Your loins speak to you, and obviously it's a metaphor. They speak to you of strength, of activity, of vigor, of action. Um, It's actually amazing how the, the most powerful part of your body is around the hips, the glutes, that whole area there has got the most power in it. And so the Bible is speaking about that center of strength. And it also speaks to us of a preparedness for war. Interesting, isn't it? Do you think of your mind and then you think of war? Because that's what you need to be thinking. In Job 38 verse 3, Job has been saying he's going to bring his calls to God. And he's going to question God. Any of you here brought your calls to God, your challenges, and think, I'm going to question God? It's amazing how puny man has the audacity to question God. And God responds to Job like this. He says, gird up now thy loins like a man. For I will demand of you, and you will answer me. And so God's not saying to Job, get ready for physical warfare. He's saying, we are going to start dealing with the questionings and the reasonings of you and the arguments of what goes on in your head. And I want to tell you, one of the things that we lack so much in today's society is true manhood. And we think true manhood is all sorts of things. The last thing we think of is a person who has mental clarity, mental fortitude. That's where true manhood lies when we have the truth of God's word renewing our minds and transforming us into the man, the woman that God's called us to be. So God's speaking to Job and he challenges him and he says, gird up your loins like a man. Do you know, a lot of us need to hear that word. Not just the men, the women. This is not a man sermon. This is for everyone. That we need to gird up the loins of our minds. That we need to prepare ourselves. That we need to be active. We need to be strong. When you look at these statements, it's a statement of warfare and it's a statement of the battle that goes on in our minds, the reasoning and the arguings. Back in the day when they used to go to war, the soldiers would gather up any loose garments. You don't want to run out to war and have loose garments. You're going to tread on them. You're going to fall over. They're going to encumber you. They're going to restrict you. So they used to get the loose garments and they would gird them up. That's what Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 6 about the belt of truth. And so we need to know that if we want to fight freely, that we don't want to be people who are tripped up. We want to be people who know how to face the enemy and deal with the attacks of the enemy. We've got to deal with this thing up in our head. We've got to deal with our thoughts. We've got to deal with our minds. And we so often forget to do that. The scripture exalts us, gird up the loins of our minds. The loins are the central part of the body, as I said, the center of our physical strength, also our reproductive strength. And so it is with our minds. Our minds are central to who we are. Just think about that for a moment. Our minds are where true strength and true weakness lies. Can you say amen to that? It's where true fruitfulness flows from. And as we ponder this this morning, we reflect on some of the scriptures that say things like this, as a man thinks, so he is. As you are thinking, 
that thinking is defining who you are. That's quite an astounding statement. Think about it for a moment. Do you know, we had the order call a little bit earlier and exhorting people having struggles and strongholds in their life. I want to assure you that without exception, every time it can be traced back to what people have allowed to go on up here. Did you hear that? It can be traced back to what people allow to go on in their thought life. And that's why the Bible says to us, gird up the loins of your mind. If you want to be a man or a woman of freedom, a man or a woman of strength, a man or a woman who overcomes, then you've got to be a man or a woman who knows how to gird up the loins of your mind. Because ultimately the battle for your mind is the greatest defining point in your life. You look at some people and you look at their minds and you wonder if they have one. Literally, just zoned out all the time, daydreaming. They never engage their mind. It's such a vulnerable place to be. The enemy can just direct them where he wants. We need to have active minds, but active in the right way, church. The Word of God says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Have you ever met a double-minded person? One minute they're saying and believing this, the next minute they're saying and believing that. They are unstable in all of their ways. Their whole life is unstable. An unstable, double-minded man is a weak man. He's a man that gets blown one way, then he gets blown the other. And whatever way the wind is blowing, whether they're winds of circumstances or winds of whoever they're around at that time, they just reflect those things. They get tossed to and fro. That's not who God has called us to be. He's called us to be men and women who know how to stand. And having done all, they stand. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? You better make sure you're standing on the Word of God. And when you've got the Word of God in your mind and your mind is renewed, you are able to stand and withstand and to stand. You don't get blown this way and that way, but you stand on the promises of God. And sometimes that's intense warfare, isn't it? Our minds need girding. We need to fasten and secure our minds. So the loose thoughts are like loose garments. They trip us up. And there's a lot of people who are getting tripped up by their own thought life. The Apostle Paul teaches us how to gird our minds. In the warfare passage that I referred to earlier, Ephesians 6, he says, having the belt of truth. If you want a strong mind and you want a mind that has uh, fortitude in it and strength in it, it's not coming down to your natural thinking. It's coming down to have I got the word of God renewing my mind. God's ways are not our ways, church. Neither his thoughts ours. As the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways and thoughts above ours. So if you want to have a mind that's renewed, you're not going to get it by being clever. You're not going to get it by saying, I'm strong, I'm going to dig my heels in, I'm going to stand, I'm going to resist. No, no, no. It comes by having the Word of God living and renewing your mind. Living in your mind and renewing your mind. The Word of God speaks about the spirit of the mind. The spirit of the mind. And we need God's Word for that. You know, we need to be aware that we mustn't trust our own thoughts. How many of you here trust your own thoughts? Do you know, it's quite interesting. When we hear things in life that challenge us, when people hear the gospel or they hear a teaching at church, they're like, I don't want to do that. You're not going to control me. It's quite an interesting thought. That's why children uh, tend to rebel against their parents because their parents are saying, don't do this. And it's like, well, I want to do this. You think to yourself that that's independence. Guess what? It's not. It's not independence. It's the fact that you've allowed your mind to be manipulated and governed by Satan, the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. There's no such thing as a truly independent mind. Every single one of us have had life experiences and heard things, and it's that which goes into the mind. It's whether we are going to say no that is false, that is lies, that is deceptions. I'm going to listen to the Word of God. I'm going to allow His truth to define who I am as a person, not the lies of the enemy. 
Satan drops seeds into our mind. Do you know, I used to often wonder when I was growing up, can the devil really do that? And how does he do it? How does he get into someone's mind? And I remember that time when I looked at that scripture, when Peter was opposing the will of God for Jesus, and Jesus turned around and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. What Jesus did in that moment is what you and I need so much in our lives, discernment as to the source of the thought. You think it's your thought, and because it's my thought, I'm going to do what I think. So many times it's the enemy putting a thought in our mind, and we're protecting that thought, we're owning it, and we're literally saying, I'm going to do what the devil wants. But he deceives us into thinking it's what we want. We must understand that the enemy can sow things into our mind. How do we protect ourselves against that? When Satan tempted Jesus, Satan actually quoted slash misquoted, misapplied scripture. He was actually using scripture to try and trip Jesus up. But Jesus had the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of discernment, and he knows what the word of God truly means, and he was able to discern and resist it. That's what you and I need in our lives. We need discernment. We need wisdom as to what goes on up in our heads. Can you say amen to that? You're not meant to just sit there listening to your thoughts. How many of you have ever had a sleepless night as your thoughts run wild? Yes? How sad is that? Jonathan's putting his hand up. (laughs) A few times. The enemy has a playtime with our minds. And he'll get in there. And I guarantee you, every time you've got a sleepless night because of your thoughts going, it's not God speaking to you. Because when God speaks to you, it has a different result. It doesn't have sleeplessness and restlessness. And so we've got to understand that we're not just to sit there and allow our thoughts to run wild and rampant while we believe more and more negativity, negativity, and yield ourselves to the temptations that the enemy wants to put there. We've got to stop and take authority, arrest our thoughts, take authority over our thoughts. The Word of God said to Gideon, Arise, you mighty man of valor. And we need to hear that sometimes in our lives when it comes to our thought life, that we need to actually get up. As God said to Job, Gird yourself like a man. This is warfare. This is being strong. This is what you need to do to protect your life. Speak God's word to yourself. Wow. This must be so important. The devil's getting upset. He missed. Yeah. Some of you are going to be set free today. You go and apply this to yourself. Speak God's word to yourself. We used to, they used to have a joke in England. What, what was the second sign of madness? Talking to yourself. The first sign is answering back or something. I forget what it was. But it, the point is this. You're actually supposed to talk to yourself. Because this thought life, they often call it self-talk. And it's going on and on and on inside here. We need to open our mouths and we need to start speaking the word of God. That's the only way you'll combat it. If you try and stop those wild thoughts at night time or those thoughts where you're getting negative and you're thinking this is happening and this person said that about you or whatever the situation is, I guarantee you that you cannot control your thoughts by trying to think more thoughts. You've got to stop, begin to speak the word of God. That's the only way you can deal with it. That's all Jesus did. When Jesus was tempted, he could have done so many things. As he said to them later on, he said, I can call a legion, 10 legions of angels. And they would have just ran Satan out of the wilderness. He could have transfigured like he did on the Mount of Transfiguration and just reveal his glory and Satan would have left. Don't forget he's omniscient and all wise. So he could have argued in circles till Satan got confused. But he did none of those things because we can't do any of those things. And he showed us the one way to deal with the devil, and that is to open our mouths and say, it is written. Now, you don't have to preface every scripture with that. You can if you want, but speak the word. Speak it out. How many of you want to speak aloud when you're by yourself? 
We know you do. I often say, Shika, are you speaking to me when she's in the office and she's having a conversation with herself? But we're talking about <laughs> speaking the Word of God. Yes? Speak it out. There's so many of us being defeated because when it comes to God's Word, we're like this. We're in a constant place of quiet meditation. Now, I'm being facetious. We need to open our mouths. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And we need to do what Jesus did and say, it is written. And you can follow it up with, get thee behind me. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Praise God. Declare it, confess it, proclaim it. When something negative begins to monopolize your thinking, those thoughts are, actually, I think if you look at recent science and studies, they'll tell you that those thoughts are toxic and poisonous to your life physically. Is that correct? It's correct. I'm looking at someone I know who's read the book. They are toxic to your life physically. They can make you physically sick. There's actual chemicals that are released in your body. But I want to tell you what's more alarming than that is that they are toxic to your spirit man. They are toxic to your soul. So this isn't just some little talk of, you know, new age, have positive thinking. This is a reality of spiritual life. We need to arrest these things in our life. They are leaking poison into so many Christian lives. Too often we allow our, our idol and natural thoughts, meaning they come from us, and satanic thoughts to fill our heads. We listen to them, and here comes the dangerous part. We own them, then we begin to speak it out. And in that place, we are believing them. And Satan leads us straight into his traps to bring misery, destruction, and death. These thoughts and words spoken actually create as I was referring to earlier on, the, the science, they actually create pathways in the brain. It's an incredible thing. That's how habits are formed. Have you ever noticed when you learn to do something for the first time that can be quite difficult? And then if you do it over and over and over again, after a while you can do it almost subconsciously because your brain has got this thing mapped out. Like have you ever been driving? When you first learn to drive, your the brake, the accelerator, you're checking everything. You, there's a heightened consciousness, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but once, you, <laughs> once you've been driving for a few years, you can drive from A to B, a trip that you always do, work, family, whatever, and you suddenly get halfway there and you think, oh my goodness, I don't remember going through the traffic lights, this, this and this, because you're just doing it because there's this pathway that's been built in your brain and we just do it subconsciously. When you think about that spiritually, it's alarming. When you allow wrong thinking, the enemy begins to build and reinforce that wrong, wrong thinking. And so people will say, I don't feel loved. It's the lie of the enemy. You are not loved. Lie. The Word of God says you are loved. Now, when you pray for people who have had this reinforced in their thinking and then they begin to speak it out, no matter how much you say to them, they'll just sit there Sad, crying, I don't feel loved. I don't feel God loves me. I don't feel anyone loves me. They have got to the stage where they've allowed that to go over and over in their thinking and they've spoken it out until it becomes a stronghold. And it takes time. And it becomes a part of their false identity. Nobody cares about you. It's a lie. People do care about you. You can't cope. Do you know there's lots of people out there today that can't cope? I was talking to someone recently who was a manager in a store and they have been taught grounding, whatever they call it, I don't know, grounding principles. So people are in store and they suddenly get stressed out because they've had to deal with three customers, not two, and it's like you take them into a room and you sit them down and they have to touch something and close their eye. And it's what they call grounding because they can't cope. I want to tell you something today. It's a lie. Seriously, it's a lie. You can cope. But if you keep being told you can't cope, you can't cope, and you go to the doctor and you say, when I do this, his anxiety builds up and I feel... They'll go give you medication, go home and say, you suffer from anxiety, you need medication for the rest of your life. Guess what that's doing? It's reinforcing that pathway in the brain 
You can't cope. You're anxious. You're this. You're that. It's lies. You're a child of God. You can cope. Believe it. You can. Why do we take these things on? We've got to start standing up. That's not to say there's not a challenge there. That's not to say there's not a battle. But the first thing we've got to start doing is saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me with might in the inner man. Hallelujah. I don't get from that I can't cope. Now, who am I going to believe, the doctor or God? Preach it. Believe God. The stress, the worry, the anxiety, the panic, it's all built on lies. And let me tell you something else. We're seeing more and more and more of it. Do you know why? Because we keep talking about it more and more and more and we have medication for it. Billions of dollars of medication. There's no ulterior motive there, I can assure you. (laughs) Church, I'm not downplaying the fact that people have struggles in their life. But what I'm saying is this. We have been reinforcing so often lies and deception and negative thinking. If you're born of God, the word of God says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That's the truth. You can either begin to speak that until that builds a pathway in your mind and it gets into your spirit, man, and sets you free. Or you can say, the doctor said, I have. And I tell you what, there's new names every day. So I've got good news for you today, church. You are loved. And if you ever doubt that, this is what you're doubting. That your heavenly father who sacrificed his son's life for you and Jesus who gave his life for you. And in the face of that, we believe a lie that God doesn't love us. When God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And we can believe a lie that says, here's the thing, is God a liar? Was the demonstration of him sacrificing his son not enough to prove his love? Or maybe it's the fact that you don't feel love. That's the lie and the deception that needs to be confronted. But it's not going to come down until you start seeing it for what it is. Just like Jesus. He didn't wait for Peter to go on and on. He immediately recognized the source. That's our biggest problem. We don't recognize things quick enough. That's a lie of the devil. I'm going to rebuke it at its source. It's not going to get a root in my mind and then stuff my whole life up. Rebuke it at the source, amen? And you say, how do I do that? Just get in the Word of God. Spend time with God. Your mind will get renewed and sharp. There'll be clarity. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound. That means a disciplined mind. Amen? Penny told me years ago when children are struggling at school, She goes, the best way to get their minds good so they can learn is get them to memorize scripture. It's truth. All of a sudden, someone who's struggling with their learning get into the word of God and the word of God being memorized and suddenly their whole learning starts to go like this because the word of God is living. Hallelujah. You ever believe you're not worth it? It's a lie. You are worth it. Just look at the price that Jesus paid for you. Look at the fact that you're loved, that you're chosen. And guess what? There are people around that like you. Amen? Tell the person next to you, do you know that there's people that like me? I'm going to see who doesn't do it. Wow, that's hard, isn't it? You're all struggling now. Church, understand that these faults and countless others have taken root so often deep, deep down inside of us. It could have been an event in our life, even a traumatic one. It may have been repeated actions by others. Oftentimes, there's parent issues that give rise to the negative and destructive thoughts. If you go through a traumatic time in your life, the devil doesn't go, oh, they've really been through a hard time. I'm just going to leave them alone until they're a bit stronger Then I'll have another go. He's wicked. He's evil. The more vulnerable you are, the more he will pour out his evil malice on you and he will get into your thoughts and this bad thing happened to you or your parents are treating you like this. And this is so often how these thoughts take root in us. And over the years we believe it. Over the years we speak it out. It's so, so deep and so, so many years in so many lives, even decades. 
it becomes what the Bible calls a stronghold. If you think of a big brick tower that's built to keep the enemy out, that's the stronghold that gets built in people's lives. And so we take, it takes a battle to tear these strongholds down. You don't just have 20 years of negative thinking in a certain area and then wake up one day and go, oh, I've learned something at church, go home and say the opposite and think that stronghold is demolished. No, you've got to be ready to go to war. You've got to begin to speak it in the face of feeling the opposite. No matter how unloved I may feel, I'm going to keep saying, God loves me. God loves me. God gave his son for me. And even though I don't feel it because of these strongholds, I want to tell you, the more I speak God's word, that thing will start to shatter. It will start to crumble. And eventually that liar will come down. I don't know how many times I prayed for people who are demonized. And the moment of deliverance comes when that demon goes out is when a liar, a stronghold is exposed. And when the liar is exposed, it's like the enemy has nothing to hide behind and the deliverance flows like that. Time and time and time again, I've seen it. And we don't realize that we're all in this battle and every single one of us has things that we've got to deal with. Scripture teaches us in 2 Corinthians 10, Bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That is true strength. That is true fortitude, character, manhood, womanhood. Learn to govern and gird up the loins of your mind. We need to take hold of ourselves. How good is that? How many of you here want to take hold of other people? That was too big of a a nod. We want to deal with other people, don't we? But you know, who we should be dealing with, we should be taking hold of ourselves. Seriously. Take yourself in hand. Start. How many of you people want to preach? I don't know why people want to do it. It's like if the call of God's on your life, then you better preach. But if it's not, stay, stay clear. Trust me. Amen? But there's one preaching you should do, and that's to yourself. Preach some good sermons to yourself. Seriously. Take yourself in hand. Amen? Praise God. Gather up all the loose, the negative, and the deceptive thinking. Then preach to yourself. Do you know sometimes if I have an encounter with someone that I want to take hold of, and I come home and I'll tell Linda, and then she'll start speaking, and then eventually I have to stop her, and I say, Linda, don't jump into the hole with me and keep digging. I shared that so you could pull me out and say, listen, the Word of God says... Yes, I'm convicted. Thank you. (laughs) We do that, don't we? We do it. Arrest yourself. Find someone that loves you enough to confront you. What's Shiko laughing at? Do you know why she's laughing? Because she loves to confront people in love. She has this Kenyan way about her. You are being selfish. You need to repent. (laughs) I tell you what, we're laughing about it, but we need church to know what it is to speak truth in love. And here's a little tip for you. If you cannot handle someone speaking the truth to you in love, you better go home and just preach all night to yourself. You need to repent. You are sitting in such a place of deception where the devil is controlling your life. Get hold of that. The moment I do not want to speak to godly people or spiritual people, the alarm bell should be going off. Because guess where I am? I'm already in the clutches of the enemy. I'm not in this place of independence. That Oh, no, no, I think, de- no, 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 you're deceived. There's no place of independence. You're either deceived by the enemy or you're getting renewed by the word of God. Can you say amen to that? Praise God. When you preach to yourself, remind yourself you are a child of God. You are born again. You are a new creation. Speak truth to yourself. If God be for you, who can be against you? You are in Christ Jesus. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. How glorious is that? Do you know what it means to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? It means you're no longer in the kingdom of darkness. You've been translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. You're no longer under the power of the enemy. He's got no unsettled claims against you. You are a free man and a free woman spiritually in Christ Jesus. 
You need to preach it to yourself until your brain believes it, and then you'll start acting like it. Do you know the exaltation of the New Testament is not on how to become a Christian? Most of the exaltation of the New Testament is like this. We've got little children in the, in the building today. You see them like this. And the younger they are, you give them a bottle, change their nappy. When they get to 10, you don't want to be doing that. And if they become a man and you're still doing that, wow, you've got some issues. True? The exaltation of the New Testament is like this. If you see a man acting like a child, you don't say to him, do this, this, and this to become a man. You actually say, you're a man, now act like it. Can you see the difference? One is saying, if you do this, this, and this, you become a man. No. You are a man, stop acting like a child and a baby. That is the majority of the exaltation of the New Testament. You are a child of God. You are born again. You are a new creation. Stop acting like an old man and start acting like who you truly are in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's what people need to hear. And guess what? There comes a time where you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I can't pray that over you. I can pray that God works in your life. I can pray for God's grace and strength. But there becomes a time that we have to get up as men, as women, and start to work out that which is true of us. Amen? Hallelujah. Oh, I've lost track of the time. I think we'll finish. Praise God. Huh? It's a public holiday tomorrow. <laughs> Praise <laughs> 1 Peter 4, 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that suffers in the flesh has ceased from sin. The question is, when we go through the trials and the tribulations, when we go through the tough times, are we going to be led by uncontrolled thoughts, toxic, deceptive, what they call stinking thinking, fleshly thoughts, or are we going to turn to God's word and allow that to direct us in this situation? Just get hold of that. What is going to cause you to be guided? The flesh, toxic thinking, the enemy, or is God's word going to guide you? Do we have any pessimists in the house? Ramesh is laughing. I don't know why. <laughs> Do you know what a pessimist is? It's somebody who expects and fears the worst, yeah? To have a negative outlook in life. So let me give you an example of how pessimism can come in. And it's a tough one for parents. When you have parents that love you and you have kids that you love, and say, for example, your kids get on their peas and they go out for a drive and they're supposed to be back at 10 and it's 11.30 and they're not back, guess what a parent starts to do? They start to worry, don't they? And it's like, have they had a car accident? Has something ha and that we just think of all of the worst possible scenarios. Some people live their life like that. They're pessimistic. They're, they're so negative. If they come into church and someone doesn't shake their hand, it's, they don't like me. They don't <laughs> I didn't know that was funny. It's, it's sad. It's sad. Take authority over those thoughts. Take authority over them and say, no, I'm not going to sit here talking about it, thinking about it, thinking that the sky is going to fall down. I remember who's on the throne. His name is Jesus and he has all power and all authority. I actually believe in the sovereignty of God. I'm preaching to myself at the same time, don't you worry. We're still human beings, even though we preach the word of God. We still have hearts that are touched by the things of this life. But we've got to come back to God's word and keep reminding ourselves. Amen? And we need to change our thought patterns. Let our thoughts be shaped and directed and governed by God's word. Governed by the truth. Amen? So let me just say this in, in closing so that we hear the gravity of what we're speaking about. When you look at Adam and Eve in the garden, the greatest battle that was ever waged, because it had the greatest consequences, 
it plunged all of humanity into spiritual death and made them slaves of the devil because they allowed the devil to get into here and deceive. We got to understand this is life and death. This is real. We've got to know what it is to resist the enemy. But I want to tell you, you'll never resist him unless you do what the scripture says before it says resist the enemy. What does that verse say? Humble yourself under the mighty arm of God. Start doing what God has called you to do through his word. As you humble yourself under God's word, it becomes so easy to resist the devil. But we don't humble under God's word. We go, no, I want this. And then the enemy comes in and we try to resist and we're weak before him. Humble yourself under God's word. Amen. Get hold of his word. This is what it says. I'm going to submit to it. And you watch. You'll be able to resist the enemy. Praise God.